No, this is an April Fool's, and no, it's not a clickbait title. Rocket Lake is a success for Intel. What's your minimum specification? So this video is sponsored by me, because I'm running the whole thing, and I have a Patreon. And if you really like this content, please consider becoming a patron over at patreon.com slash techtechpotato. Your investment really does help the channel. We are looking into merch, uh, not exactly sure exactly what we'll do yet, and I'm saying exactly way too much, but I do think merch is on the way. Please let me know what you'd like to see in the comments below. So we've now had Rocket Lake that has uh, been on the shelves for two days. Uh, reviews are in. Reviews are universally panning the product. Um, performance isn't as high as people were expecting. It's too power hungry. Uh, in Core i9 case, it's too expensive. Core i5 is competitive. Uh, but overall, it's not a true generational uplift that users expect from a microarchitecture advancement. Part of that is the fact they're going down from 10 cores to 8 cores because we're going from a 10 core 220 square millimeter die to a 8 core 270 square millimeter die based on the fact we're redesigning a 10 nanometer core for 14 nanometer. Even though the product doesn't look great, even though it's been universally panned, um, it probably will sell well depending on AMD stock levels. But the point here is Rocket Lake is definitely a success for Intel. It means so many things to Intel that I think we should all be aware of. Now, why does Rocket Lake exist anyway? Um, Rocket Lake is non-standard for Intel. Intel used to be TikTok, TikTok. TikTok, TikTok. But now we're in a situation where because of the delays to 10 nanometer, Intel had to refresh Skylake to Coffee Lake, had to refresh Skylake to Coffee Lake Refresh, had to refresh Skylake to Comet Lake. And now we have still got another generation of 14 nanometer because 14 nanometer versus 10 nanometer, 14 nanometer is the only process that could hit the high frequencies required for a desktop product. Lower frequencies are okay for say a notebook product or for a server product for the Ice Lake stuff. Um, but for a desktop product, we need high frequencies and 14 nanometer is the only one that can provide. Now, frequencies depend on both the core design and the manufacturing process. So when Intel recreated its 10 nanometer product on 14 nanometer, it had to, it had to do some redesign for frequency and make sure it still worked. But the point here is in order to fill a gap in their roadmap, um, Intel could have launched nothing post KB Lake until 10 nanometer was ready. That would mean we'd have, what, three years without an Intel product, four years without an Intel product. Back when Comet Lake was launched, people said, well, why don't you just do something on 10 nanometer, do some new micro design on even 14 nanometer. Now it's here. People act like they don't want it and they're waiting for older Lake. But the point about this video is to explain what happens when a company designs a new processor, designs new, a new core, a new design, um, and why Intel had to essentially do this backport or retrofit or whatever you want to call it, and why it's a success. So think about Intel, think about designing a core anyway in three broad terms. You have the SOZ design team, you have the silicon implementation team, and then you have the manufacturing. If you just think about going through one core at a very high level, one product, you have the manufacturing side starts with a process development kit for the manufacturing process. So whether that's 14 nanometer or 10 nanometer, they say, this is how to build, this is how transistors work on our process. That goes to the SOC design team and they design an SOC around that PDK. So the core has a certain amount of execution ports. We've got um, these size buffers, these size caches. We've got this amount of IO, PCIe, DDR. Uh, all that goes into the SOC design. Then it goes, kind of goes back to manufacturing and manufacturing says, yep, okay, that will work on our, on our um, manufacturing node or they'll get an updated PDK and they have to manage with that. Then it goes to the silicon implementation where they take the SOC design and they just design, they essentially put the floor plan down. So this is going from tape in to tape out. When the floor plan is done, we're in tape out. Then it goes to manufacturing again. Manufacturing actually creates the product and then we go to the analysis side of, well, does the product reach frequencies needed? Do we need to go back and do a, a silicon refresh? Um, you know, do we need to fix any bugs? That sort of thing. But overall, it's kind of like a five, six stage process at a really, really high level. But the point is you can't 
go really do the SOC design part properly and let you have a PDK that works. Now, if the PDK keeps changing, if the design rules for the manufacturing process, as is what's happened on 10 nanometer, keeps changing, then you have to keep redesigning your SOC. Or maybe you've got an SOC design that works. It kind of still works with a PDK, but you're waiting for the silicon implementation and the manufacturing to get the frequencies right, to get the yields right. You kind of sit on your laurels if you're in that SOC design team and you've got you know, several different products ready to go down the line and it's just waiting for manufacturing or something to turn up. So Intel launched you know, Ice Lake on 10 nanometer and then Tiger Lake on 10 nanometer. And then about the time that um, Ice Lake was essentially getting ready to come to market, um, Ice Lake came to market in mid-2019. So the first, or at least several stages of silicon would have been designed by Q1 2019. Um, Intel on a recent uh, AMA on Reddit said that the design process for Rocket Lake started in kind of Q1 2019 when Ice Lake was pretty much done. Um, you know, just the final elements to do in, in that design. So we're at a point where Intel is taking an SOC design purely built for 10 nanometer, purely for the cores, the uh, Sunny Cove cores on 10 nanometer, and they had to redesign that exact same SOC layout for 14 nanometer. Now, going from 14 to 10 nanometer was a, Intel said it was a 2.7x density increase. It's reduced by then um, due to the updates that they've had to make for 10 nanometer. But the whole point is going back the other way, the core should arguably be 2.7x bigger. Now, you can't just put it in a photocopier and set the size to 2.7x. You have to deal with signal integrity and repeaters and power and all that sort of thing. It's a very complex process. But you're starting out, you're still starting out with a core designed for 10 nanometer and you're redesigning it on 14 nanometer. This back port, or I like, to, I like, I started calling it now a retrofit because I think a retrofit fits better. Um, then through that process, Intel has learned what it takes to retrofit a core onto a process which it wasn't designed for. There's a lot of stuff to learn. Now, whether that endpoint was productizable into Rocket Lake and whether it actually makes sense to make a product out of it, we can argue until the cows come home, you know, reviews are out. But actually doing the work, doing the hard work, that's where the value is for Intel. Now, we've seen in announcements and slides that Intel moving forward is going to kind of have this sort of backporting plan. It would, and Bob Swan and Pat Gelsinger have spoken about disaggregated core designs, building cores for multiple process nodes. And now that Intel has its Intel Foundry services, it's going to have to do that more. So why is Rocket Lake so important in that in that ecosystem, in that design? Well, Intel has learned how much work a backport takes and what are the trade-offs that go on with doing a backport, with doing a retrofit. Um, in the future, when it's doing this disaggregated core design, it will do what ARM does with something like, say, the A53 core. Now, that core was designed with multiple process nodes in mind. You had to build it, be able to build it on TSMC. You had to build it on Global Foundries. You had to build it on Samsung. You had to build it on multiple process nodes within those two factories. You also had to build it on uh, SMIC in China or UMC or some of the smaller fabs. Co-design is so much different to targeted design that it's not a backport anymore. The core is designed for with both PDKs in mind. That five-step stack we were talking about, five, six-step stack, you're now building, doing your SOC design. You're now doing the second step with both PDKs in hand. And you know what trade-offs you're going to have to make when you design that core. If one core has, um, you know, say, a maximum length for in order to create signal integrity, then you have to build your SOC design and then implement it in silicon with that in mind. With Rocket Lake, that was never the case. With this retrofit, that was never the case. It wasn't co-designed. Future cores will be co-designed. This is why this backport, this retrofit Rocky Lake means so much for Intel because they have learned more than anything related to the sales of Rocket Lake, I think. This is why it's a win for them, regardless of the product. Stop thinking about product. Start thinking about silicon design. Co-design is where the future's at and Intel is now starting on this process moving forward. Intel has said it will license its x86 cores, um, whether it will license it for external foundry use or purely for internal foundry use. We're not exactly sure yet, and the terms to do with those licenses um, still not announced yet. 
However, it does mean that Intel is going to have to take this into heart with all future x86 core designs, even future graphics designs. I mean, we've now got XE on 10 nanometer and 14 nanometer. We had Gen graphics on 10 nanometer, on 14 nanometer, on 22 nanometer, and maybe even a few beyond that. But the point is, co-design is where it's at. If we see Intel retrofitting, backporting another core, Intel will take what it's learned with Rocket Lake and try and find ways to get around that in the future. And the best way to get around that is going to be with co-design. So what exactly is the minimum specification here? What does Intel need to do future with its disaggregated core design? And the answer is co-design. DTCO, Design Technology Co-Optimization. It's not only just for fabs, it's now also for core design as well.